Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the panel discussion on game-based and gamified learning. Uh, I know some people are still ga gathering lunch and stuff, and feel free as the conversation goes on to get up again and get lunch. We usually have lots and lots of food, so um, get seconds if you need it. Go back and get something that you forgot. Um, I think to start out, we should probably introduce ourselves. I'm Carrie Kephart. I'm with the Faculty Development Center, and I think we could maybe, um, I'll introduce our two panelists and then go around the room counterclockwise and introduce ourselves. Um, and Dr. Ann Rubin is here from the History Department, and she'll be sharing with us, I think, after um, Dr. Josh Enzer, um, a little bit of what she does uh, with games in her classroom. And Josh Enzer in the Department of Chem Chemical and Biochemical Engineering. Um, we'll, we'll start off after I make a few remarks. Um, but before we do that, let's go around the table and everybody introduce yourself and, and your department and where you're coming from. You have to so, go first and take a bite. <laughs> 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 Sorry, we wait until you take a bite and then we make you say your name and, and oh, where you're from. Great, great. All right. Uh, I'm Trimi Yuan from <laughs> Economics. I'm Carolyn Forrest here from Political Science. John Fritz from Information Technology. Sherry Braxton Labor, Information Technology. Jacqueline Perkorian. Um, I work on a joint project between the, um, the Dean's Office in um, Engineering and Information Technology and the Department of Education. And I'm Karen Mattingly, College of Engineering and Information Technology Dean's Office. I'm Lindsay Kelm. I'm from Chemistry and Biochemistry Department. I'm Meg Garvin. I'm from Computer Science. I'm Stephen McAlvin from Interdisciplinary Studies. I'm Jennifer Harrison with the Faculty Development Center. Vicki Williams, Teacher Education. Diana Hamilton, Chemistry. Linda Hodges, Faculty Development Center. Eric Anderson, Physics. Tom Pennis. Can't talk about it on here. Tom Pennis, <laughs> Information Technology. All right. Well, um, welcome. I want to start out by stepping behind the monitor here because I have to um, prompt myself with a few of the slides that I put together here. I wanted to give some context to? overall for the panel uh, before having it turning it over to the panelists. Um, I was looking for, furiously looking for before, to, before I came today, some statistics about the size of the uh, educational gaming industry. It's huge. I couldn't find good statistics that would, would, would say it, but just trust me, it's huge. It's and huge and growing. Um, but a few things I did find that kind of give some context. Oops, I didn't use that. Um, there is uh, this group, a uh, recently put together group called the Higher Ed, Higher Education Video Game Alliance, specifically focusing on video games in education, which is a big part of the focus these days, but I don't want to suggest that video gaming is all that we're about. Um, uh, but in any case, they've done a survey of uh, programs at the higher ed level that offer degrees or certificates or something like that. And just to give you a sense that they had 73 respondents, I think they were suggesting that there were more people that didn't respond to their survey, but amongst those that were, um, as you can see, quite a few degree granting programs, um, 39 at the bachelor's level um, in, in video gaming related things or gaming related uh, degrees. Um, so that's one measure. Um, our president also is putting a high priority on gaming for learning. Um, he says he's calling for investments in educational technology that will help create educational software that's as compelling as the best video game. Um, and then um, another sort of measure. For those of you who don't know, I wouldn't have recognized this image because I'm not a video gamer. But this is uh, an image from World of Warcraft, which is, um, I, b I believe, the most popular online video game that, that exists in the world. And um, at some point in the recent past, there were more than 10 million subscribers. I think it's more than that. Now, I'm actually going to come down slightly. But uh, they've spent an average, or spent an average of 23 hours per week immersed in World of Warcraft. And I believe I read some 5.9 million combined years of World of Warcraft have been played <laughs> by all the video gamers in the world. Wow. So it's huge. Um, before we go too much further, I think we had kind of two words in the title for this uh, panel, learning games or gaming, game-based learning, versus gamification. There's, there's, of course, games that you might use in the classroom, you might play for pedagogical purposes, and then there's ways of turning the classroom into a more gamified 
environment overall. Gamification refers to bringing elements of gaming into learning activities with the goal of creating a more motivating and memorable learning experience. So not necessarily playing a game, but making the whole learning experience more gamified, more like a game. So why should we teach with games? Well, one big reason is games are motivating. This is, uh, this is evidence right here, from photo evidence of how motivating games are. And you, you can, you've seen it, um, if you aren't a gamer, you've certainly seen it on other people's faces when they're immersed. There's no getting through to them for any other purpose. So games are very motivating. How do they motivate? Well, they're interactive. Um, in large part, the, in, either the gamer is interacting with other gamers or they're interacting with the game elements itself. Um, they are contextualizing and structuring the experience in ways that are um, goal-oriented, that encourage the gamers to take risks, but of course risks that are also supported so there's no, generally no human bodily risk. I mean, you're not, you're not risking your health if other than maybe staying up too long and drinking too much uh, caffeine. Um, it it's, uh, encourages risk taking, but they also, the way they're structured optimizes the challenge so that they're always giving you um, just enough challenge to keep you in, interested in the game and motivated, but not so much that you're going to give up and, and run away. The best games are designed that way. Um, they also provide a lot of rapid feedback, and that's important to keep gamers and, and learners motivated. So um, I want to give some examples of some of the kinds of games that are out there. This, this particular game, Reacting to the Past, is not a video game. It is a, a live simulation, um, and, and uh, the games are created in a very elaborate way that uh, engage whole classes of students for weeks at a time in some historical event, um, giving them real roles for the most part. Some of the roles are, are uh, um, made up just for the game, but a lot of times the players are, the students are playing the roles of actual historical figures. Um, games like Reacting to the Past, as well as a lot of um, uh, video games, allow the players to take on new perspectives. They allow them to get, immerse themselves in a, somebody else's experience, um, which we know is, is a, an important goal in a lot of the learning that we want them to do. This is an example <coughs> of another game that is uh, recently created called Fair Play. It's a, it's a very interesting game that puts graduate students in roles of, uh, of um, non-traditional, students from non-traditional backgrounds, and has them go through the game learning what it's like to be a graduate student who, for example, none of the, none of the past faculty members look like them. So um, that's a relatively recent game that was created specifically for, uh, for learning. Um, Good games require learning. So a game that's well-structured, well-designed, actually um, motivates through uh, requiring the learners to learn, or le requiring the players to learn. When we're actively engaged with the game, our minds are experiencing the pleasure of grappling with and coming to understand a new system. And that's a quote from John Seeley Brown, who's done a lot of thinking and writing um, and consulting on <coughs> design of video games, or design of games for learning. Actually, I think I want to hold off on this. Um, I have a few, few comments about, if we have time, about ways that we can think about designing games for the learning environment. But before we do that, I think we'll actually hear what our panelists have done in their own <coughs> We'll start with Josh. All right, sure. oh, and, but while Josh is getting up here, I have some books that I thought I'd pass around and take a look. I have a couple of books on the reacting to the past game that I've mentioned, um, one about the game, how, it's, how, it was, how it came to be, and another one, the Game Designer's Handbook, so I'll pass that around. Um, James Paul G., um, noted uh, thinker in, in games and learning, had his book to pass around, and then, oh, this is the reacting to the past game that I played recently, if you have questions about that, I can tell you about it. Hi. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so I'm actually going to talk mostly about what Carrie was talking about called gamification or the idea of gamifying a class. Uh, and it's actually a lot lower 
investment on your part than you may think. I think there are things we already do in the classroom and in designing our courses that it's just really subtle tweaks that can really change the way that students look at what we're doing. Uh, and so I will walk through how I've implement this, implemented this in a couple of classes that I've taught. Um, but first, I'm going to steal some things from, that doesn't show up very well, uh, so maybe I won't steal these things, uh, from some people who have done some work on game-based learning and gamification in the classroom. Uh, a typical game has a number of elements, and I'll read the ovals for you. Um, but games have rules. They have conflict. There may be levels to it. There's a story element. There are rewards. Um, there's a time component. There may be a teamwork component. Uh, and again, that frequent feedback is something that's really important. Uh, and a number of these things already exist in most classes, right? There are rules. You've got your syllabus. You've got your contract. There are goals. You have learning objectives. You want students to be meeting them. There are mechanisms for feedback. They're doing homework. They're taking tests. They're doing projects. And you're providing input. There may or may not be teamwork, depending on the class that you're doing. And of course, there's a time-based element to this as you're unrolling things across the term of the course. Uh, so to gamify a class, we really need to think about aesthetic or kind of the style to how we're presenting things. Uh, maybe a rewards mechanism. Maybe there's an underlying story. Uh, some mode for conflicts or for levels uh, in order to really bring all these things together and have what would be called a gamified class. So we're already halfway there, five out of the 10. Uh, so one way that we can take a course and make it more gamified is to kind of just look at these in different sets. Uh, so again, we can have our learning goals and our feedback uh, and even a little bit of style to the course um, by assigning points in a different way than usual. So I tend to lean on experience points or XP. Uh, again, what associated with video games, something that's kind of common uh, there. There may be a way to manipulate how the time unravels in the class. And I correlate that with levels. So I'll explain what I mean there in a little bit. They can see how they're progressing through the class as the semester goes on. Um, most engineering courses, at least all the ones that I teach, have an uh, element of teamwork to them. Uh, and there may or may not be a story as to why you put them together or make them do the projects that they're doing. Uh, and then I have ways that they can compete against each other for little low stakes things. Things, uh, and I'll explain some of my mechanisms or rationales for that that don't actually impact their scores or their grades in the class, but are worth just enough that they are going to try for them. Um, so I'm just going to summarize what I've gamified in two of the classes that I've taught um, relatively frequently. Um, so this, I'm teaching both of them this spring. Um, problem solving and experimental design is a required course that we have for all of our sophomores. Uh, it's a four credit course. It's a writing intensive course. It's a lab course. It's everything but the kitchen sink, uh, obviously. Uh, so they meet for three 50-minute discussions a week and one two-hour lab. Um, over the last five semesters, I've had 157 students in the gamified version of the course give me some feedback about it. Uh, we talk about computer programming, which is what made the video game theme kind of make sense for what we were doing, uh, statistics and technical communication. Um, so what I implemented in this class is starting to be known as BPL gamification for badge points level. Uh, so nothing on top of that other than really just converting the point scheme for the class so that it's experience points instead of whatever other scores you assign for classes. Uh, the level system is really important because I really hammer home this idea that you're earning your points as you go. So you literally start the class with a zero, uh, which is a little discouraging to some students. So there's a mechanism that we set up to say, well, you're making good progress if you're up to this level by this time. Um, and then I also have taken advantage of Blackboard to kind of code in badges or achievements. Uh, I don't use them in the traditional way that it's something that necessarily impacts their grade, um, but it's to promote different behaviors in the classroom or outside the classroom. And I'll give a couple examples of that. And if we've got time, show you a little bit about how that works in Blackboard. I see all the students in this class the next spring for chemical process control and safety, uh, where I've tried to implement more of the game-based elements. Um, so from day one, they're told that they're starting an internship with this fictitious chemical company. And they're going to have to work in groups and submit memos to give progress updates uh, as they're basically designing chemical processes across the course of the semester, just highlighting the major features of the class. So we talk about optimization. We talk about controls and system design. Uh, and then we talk about process safety, industrial hygiene. Uh, so that class also has a lecture and a lab component. Uh, instead of giving them points or experience points, they actually earn commissions based on the quality of their memos and the quality of their work. Uh, so they can earn up to $100,000 by the end of the semester. And then that gets converted into a grade. Um, <laughs> so the other element that I add to that, so the competition element, again, rather than competing for extra credit or, for, or anything, they can compete for extensions on major project deadlines. So the groups that behave the best in class or do a certain thing outside of class, 
can have an extra 48 or 96 hours compared to the other teams in the class. Uh, and at the end of the semester, inevitably, they want to convert those unused extensions into points. But as an engineer, time and points are different units, right? Different quantities, so that doesn't work. But they can compete for those extensions. And sometimes those are really valuable, because I don't necessarily know when they have exams or other major projects going on. So it adds a little bit of flexibility. Um, so I wanted to give just an overview. I mentioned this is kind of a low investment thing. Anyone can literally gamify a class in a couple of hours and just kind of typing things up and being creative with how you present things on the syllabus. Um, so you may think of a class in terms of the way that you're earning, assigning the points at the end of the semester kind of already. 10% is assigned for homework and 20% is for lab reports and so on. And you've got a grading scale. You've taught this class before. Maybe you haven't. Um, but you have an idea for what it takes to earn an A, B, C, or D. Gamification is literally just rebranding. You don't change a thing about the way you're conducting your course. You just change the way you're discussing it and sharing it with students. So the first thing, instead of assigning percentage points, you can convert that into some other currency. Uh, experience points is what I use with the sophomores in the programming class. Again, we deal in thousands of dollars uh, in the internship class uh, that we run. Um, so first, we change uh, all the percentages to experience points, then you probably need to rescale that so that it kind of makes sense to what's going on because you know students don't want to only have 100 points total to earn across the course of the semester. At least most games don't work that way. Uh, so I multiplied everything through by 20. Uh, so now everything is worth you know a reasonable amount. So at the end of the semester, there's up to 2,000 points that can be earned, right? Um, I changed the names of the things, so homework has become a not so random encounter. In fact, you know exactly when you're going to encounter it. Uh, they have uh, solo lab reports that they have to write, and they have group lab reports and a group portfolio that they submit at the end of the semester. So they have solo quests and guild quests, if you will. Um, but you can pick whatever theme you want, right? Again, this is, ha this is a course that has a pretty programming-based background, so the video game thing kind of felt right for what we were doing here. Uh, and then finally, that percentage scheme at the end of the semester, you just replace that with something that is in terms of the experience points that they can earn. And this is where the level aspect of it comes into play, because again, you're literally telling them you have a zero right now, and you have to work your way up to 1,700 experience points in order to earn an A in the class. I have to fight them a lot. They all have this mentality that they start the class with 100, and I'm like punching them and taking away points. Um, but we work on that. We try and rebrand it. And I think there's a positive element to that, right? It's now you're earning the points you're earning the credit rather than me trying to trick you and steal points at the last minute or something like that. Um, so again, I try and stagger in a level up system so that again, you have zero at the start, but at first it's pretty easy to level up in the first couple weeks of the semester. And then it kind of eventually gets to a point where those levels correspond to your grade at the end of the semester. Because it's kind of discouraging to sit here in week 11 of the semester and everyone still technically has an F in the class, right? Because we haven't had the final exam. We haven't had all the other ways that you can earn experience points. But they're cool with being at level 9 or at level 10. They know that there's more to be working on. Uh, and so that kind of psychological element, I think, is kind of important uh, to improve morale and things too. I wanted a really quick show. Blackboard has been upgraded very recently. There's some really cool achievement tools that are actually already built in um, that don't take a ton of work to implement. So again, this is how you can implement a badge-based system. Uh, and so I just have, I'm pulling up my sophomore class right here. You can literally create an achievement for whatever you feel like and then code it to a gra grade column in your Blackboard site. You can even go in and just deliberately hand an achievement to a certain person by their username or but by what team they're on. Uh, so I have an achievement if you logged into the Blackboard site before the start of the semester. You got something for that. You get an achievement if you come visit office hours. Uh, and then I also have coded in kind of the level system so you can see who's in what level at any given time. Tells them how many experience points they have at that particular point. Um, so really quickly, just to show an example uh, of the office hours one, I have this coded to something that's in the grade book. Um, when you go to create an achievement, you just have to give it a name. Uh, and that's what's up here. There's a couple things that you have to select here. And I just kind of pick whatever the custom, random, normal thing is. You tell why they earned the achievement that they got. Uh, and then you get to explain what in Blackboard is going to say this person has this achievement, this person doesn't have this achievement. 
Uh, and so you literally just have to define a certain condition within Blackboard. You have the ability that everyone can see that achievement after a certain date and time. That's one of the things that Blackboard lets you do. Uh, again, you can literally browse and just say, I'm giving this person this achievement. So you don't even have to know anything more about how to program Blackboard than that. Uh, you can just type in their username, their UMBC ID, and they're good to go. Uh, or you can give them uh, one of the teams in the group may, or in the class may just automatically earn an achievement, and so you can select them and put them over there. It's got some good team names this semester. All the good team names are gone. It's one of my favorites. Uh, or most commonly, what I use is what's in gr the grade center, right? So I can say that I want you to look at a certain, um, certain category in my grade book, and then if they have a score that's greater than this particular number, they'll be able to see the achievement. If they don't, they won't. Um, and I use that even for things rather than putting in usernames by hand. It's easier for me to make a column in Blackboard and just type the word true or false, right? Or really what I do is I type true or I leave it blank because one of the options is this button here that says user has at least one attempt for the item. So if the word true is there, they see it, and if I leave it blank, they don't. Uh, and so that's kind of convenient. I should back up, I think I missed one detail that's really important, and you can choose whether students can see it, a possible achievement in advance or not. And I think that's really important for motivation and for trying to promote a certain type of behavior. Um, for example, I usually give achievements if you ace an exam, you know you get something, but I don't want everyone who didn't ace the exam to see that they missed that achievement. That's a little sad. Um, I mean, they don't like it either, so I don't do that. Instead, um, and conveniently, what the new Blackboard lets you do is you can say whether an achievement is visible to students before uh, they <coughs> earn it or not. So the office hours one, totally, you can see that you could earn this achievement just by coming to office hours. And I've had more students come to office hours than ever this semester, so something's working. Uh, there was one more page, so again, this is the page where you can say it's based on a grade center. So again, I have a grade center column that says came to office hours. If the word true is there, they can see that achievement. And that's all it really takes. Um, you then have the ability, yes, you have the ability to select a reward. I don't really know what this does yet. Um, but basically, I let them have a sticker and then it like appears somewhere else on Blackboard. I don't really know. Um, but that's all it takes. And then you have your own achievements coded. When they log into Blackboard, even if they don't log into your site, they get a notification at the top of their screen the next time they log into Blackboard. So I get to psychologically trick them to look at my site more than all their other classes this semester, right? Because they see this. Uh, one other quick thing is kind of nice. You can see exactly how many people have earned a specific achievement uh, over on the right hand side there. So Blackboard is really cool. Uh, it's gotten way better at this than it used to be oh, um, for coding things. <laughs> so that's just a riff on the old movie sequel titles, right? What, what was the movie where it was that two electric boogaloo? I don't remember. What was it? Break in. Break in, right. So I try and do like different random puns. Um, as a, for certain achievements. The e-sticker is kind of out of homage for Taran Bales, who still puts stickers on people's exams when they get an A. Our students love that. Um, so, so my version is the electronic sticker. Um, so anyway. So that's um, one way that Blackboard can be used. I just have a couple more um, graphs here that I wanted to show um, that basically I've also surveyed the students every semester. So I haven't been able to demonstrate that game-based learning increases learning. Uh, I want to do that eventually, but the easiest, the low pi lowest picking fruit is to give them a survey and say, hey, did you like it? Uh, and so I've asked the students across both of those courses what their attitude is about having this non-traditional delivery of uh, the way that points are earned and grades are earned in the system. Uh, and so you can see pretty overwhelmingly this is neutral. Everything on this side is positive or stronger than that. Uh, they actually get a little bit more neutral and more <laughs> strongly positive in the sequel uh, in the course that has the story-based element than in just the traditional BPL gamification. I asked them if they think it should keep going and pretty much the same kind of results. Um, but now that I've had the students in more than one required course, I actually got to also ask, you know, did you like the second version better than the first one? So the second version, again, they're in an internship, they're earning salary, they're writing these memos and progress updates. Uh, and so the people who thought that was better than the first type of gamification said that they liked it because it was a little bit more realistic to what they thought they would be doing um, with their career. Uh, and they also a few people made comments about how they liked that they were earning thousands of points or thousands of dollars for doing different things, right? Whatever it takes at this point. 
Um, for some people, their attitudes changed in the negative direction. They said, yeah, it was fun the first time, but you got to get a new stick, right? So the novelty had worn <laughs> off a little bit. Uh, and some were a little overwhelmed by the idea of earning thousands and thousands of points at a time. Uh, and so there was one person, he literally wrote in his comments, I was working really hard because I kept getting a 1960 out of 2000 on homework. And then I realized that that was a 98%. And so I stopped working to get up to the 2000. So some people get a little psyched out by numbers. <laughs> Um, but pretty much across the board, it was interesting when I asked, you know, when I compared the two courses to each other, it's pretty much a net change, in, uh, no change in terms of should I keep doing this in future courses. So their attitudes changed in both directions across the two implementations. Um, and those are more just conclusions that I think Carrie has hit on about how important games can be for kind of motivating things. But I think we'll move things along and sh I'll hand things off to Anne and she can tell us what she's been doing Great. as well. Did I get unplugged? No, that's my Oh, that's phone. your phone. <laughs> that, that's what happens. When I was about to pocket it. And the speaker thing. There we go. Well, my course couldn't be more different um, from Josh's in that. Nobody gets stickers, but uh, they do get to play games in my class. And so um, it's a Monday night class. And, and if you've been over in the administration building on Monday nights, you might have seen us playing Monopoly or Life. Uh, fortunately, nobody cried during the Monopoly game. Um, we've played all kinds of computer games. We've played Oregon Trail, which is one of the oldest educational games, um, which one of my students was so inspired that then she went home and kept playing until she could get on the Oregon Trail leaderboard. <laughs> um, we've played Valiant Hearts, which is a new game about World War I, where you take on the personas of different World War I soldiers. And we've played smaller games um, that have more sort of humanitarian impulses attached to them about um, trying to escape from Syria or trying to get water in Darfur. So a real range of games. Um, my class this semester is called Replaying the Past. And it is actually sponsored by the Rabowski Fund for Innovation. And so what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about how we came to this and how we're using games and designing games in our class and then suggest a little bit of future directions for this. Um, the genesis of this project actually came a couple of years ago when the head of uh, social studies education for Anne Arundel County approached the history department who they'd worked with for years on um, various teacher training programs and they were interested in developing a game about world history which is taught now in 10th grade. And over the course of, of uh, several discussions, we realized that what they wanted was much bigger <laughs> than we could feasibly deliver. But um, through the conversations, I met Mark Olano in the computer science department, and we started talking about what could we implement on a smaller scale. So um, what we do is, is my class is made up of a mixture of history master's degree students a few advanced undergraduates, I think they're all seniors, maybe one is a junior, and actually a few students who are also getting their masters in teaching. And altogether I have 12 students. And we're working in conjunction with the video game design track in computer science and visual arts. And so in that track, if you're not familiar with it, um, the capstone class is a mixture of computer science students and visual arts students, and they work together in teams to build games. And in fact, this semester, they're building two games. One team is building a game for us, which obviously I'll detail in a minute. And the other team is building a game for Signature Theater. So we're their clients, basically, in, in thinking of it as a, a, they're basically simulating working for a game design company. Um, our game is centered around Civil War Baltimore, and because I am a Civil War historian, and specifically the Pratt Street Riots of 1861. That's the real heart of the, the game that the students in the game design class are building. Um, it was the first bloodshed in the Civil War. What happened, if you're not familiar with it, is that um, just at the start of the Civil War, uh, 
Union troops from Massachusetts were coming through Baltimore, and at that time you couldn't uh, drive a locomotive through the city of Baltimore. So they had to get off at one train station and march through the city to Camden Station. And as they were doing this, they were attacked by a pro-Southern mob, and the riots ensued, and uh, four soldiers were killed and about, I think, a dozen or so Baltimoreans. So. Um, the game that emerged out of the game designers is a game called Bandit. And the um, main character is a fox. Yeah, get it, let it out. Um, the main character is a fox, and the fox is running through the streets of downtown Baltimore. And the fox, um, his objective is to actually overhear conversations and grab documents. And if you overhear or grab doc a certain number of these, um, then you can slow down the Pratt Street rides. You can make them less um, violent, I guess. And that's the kind of the win condition. So there, we actually just saw a video the other night of, of where they are now. And the students have, at this point, even done a really fantastic job of rendering Civil War era Baltimore. And the fox looks really good. And, Right now, my students are working on creating the documents that are going to get dropped into the game. So that's the kind of premise of it. Um, the way that, because we're working with these gaming design students, what we did in my class was we front-loaded history. And we spent about three weeks really digging deep into the history of Civil War Maryland, the history of Civil War Baltimore. My students each wrote very traditional history papers. We created a big group um, online bibliography using the program Zotero. And then we're using that corpus of work as the basis for everything else we do that over the course of the semester. So we have done a lot of theoretical reading. The books that Carrie passed around are, in fact, uh, some of the books that we've done in our course. And we were fortunate Carrie actually came and talked to us a lot about um, reacting to the past. We have you know, talked theoretically about how games inspire learning. We've um, looked at different kinds of games. But what I also realized this summer as I was thinking about this class, and I actually took a workshop on games and video games in the classroom, was that my students should have the experience of making games for themselves, which um, for historians often seems a little bit terrifying, <laughs> truth be told. Um, and so over the course of this semester, my students are making two games. Um, the first game that they, they've completed already, they worked in teams and they built board games, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And now they're, we've just started the process of having them build individual text-based games. Um, we are historians. None of us really know how to program. Um, so we're using very simple tools that, uh, that even humanities people can, can make sense of. Um, the board games that they came up with, and I realized I should have brought some photographs of them, and actually the boards are still sitting in my office, um, were great. They came up with, they were in three groups, and so uh, one game was you're a runaway slave and you're trying to escape from Maryland into Pennsylvania. And along the way, you uh, draw cards, and, and these cards have incidents drawn from actual Maryland slave narratives or from actual Maryland runaway slave ads. Um, and then the best part, I think, that they put in was even once you reach Pennsylvania, you have to be able to roll a certain number to be free so that there's this period of time where you're sort of stuck in limbo, which I think was very effective at showing that even when you think you're free, you're not really free. The second game is called Battle for the Capital, um, which featured what everyone in the class thought was the the funniest feature, which was the combat zone. Um, in this game, you are playing as either somebody from the Union Army or from the Confederate Army. And you're trying to take Washington, DC, which Confederate soldiers actually got within five miles of the White House in the summer of 1864. So it's kind of riffing off of that. And again, as you are marching your men um, towards the Capitol, you might run into, you know, your men are hungry, lose a turn. Or something will happen to deplete your troop strength, things like that. So again, these kinds of conditions that come into play. Um, and then the final game that they came up with is about the divided loyalties in Baltimore. Baltimore was a city very divided between pro-Confederates and pro-Union. 
And in this game, first of all, there's one feature where you can switch sides. If you draw a certain card, you switch. So you pick at the beginning whether you want to be pro-union or pro-confederate, but you might have to change. And then the other piece of the game that I thought was really, really clever is you're trying to get to the um, end of the board, basically, but you're at risk of getting thrown into prison in Fort McHenry. And if you are thrown into prison in Fort McHenry, if you're pro-union, you can get out on, let's say it's a two or a four. If you roll that number, you can get out. If you're pro-Confederate, you can only get out if you roll like a six. So that it's harder. The game is actually harder if you play pro-Confederate, that the, the deck is sort of stacked against you, which again, I think is a really great way of emulating how difficult it was to be pro-Confederate in a union-controlled city. So I was really impressed with what they came up with. Um, then we had a chance, each, the students each played the, uh, each other's games. And uh, what we realized was, first of all, that as much as they learned from playing the games, they learned more from the process of building the games. That it was building the games where I think a lot of the real learning took place. And, and also what they learned, um, a lot of it was, how, uh, was a struggle between how complex you can make the game and how much strategy you can put into the game. You know, as historians, we love to complicate things. Um, and, and in building these games, you often have to simplify. And that was a real tension that they grappled with. What we're doing now um, for the last phase of the semester is we're working with a program that's free online called Twine, which is used to build text-based games. And there's been a lot of um, attention paid to Twine in the past six months or so um, because it's a, a program that lends itself to very different kinds of games. It's the sort of anti-World of Warcraft. You know, if, if the vast majority of commercial games are designed for 18 to 25-year-old men, and built, frankly, by 18 to 25-year-old men, um, the games built by tw in Twine are often built by women. Um, they're often built by activists. They're often built, um, many of these games center around sexuality, many of these games center around um, issues of loss. Probably the most famous Twine game out there right now is a game called Depression Quest. And um, it's actually um, used almost as a, can be used almost as a screening tool. But what happens in Depression Quest is it, it gives you a, a window into what it's like to live with depression. And we actually played it in class last night. And one of the, um, I think, really interesting mechanisms there is depending on the choices you make, depending on sort of how depressed you say you are at the beginning, certain choices are forestalled to you. So if your re response to the first setback you have is to crawl into bed and pull the covers up over your head, it's harder for you to move yourself out of depression because you're sort of deeper in. Um, the other big piece of these Twine games or this Twine game revolution is because it's open source, because it's freely available, because it's text-based, it's all built on the metaphor of cards. It's basically you're storyboarding things out. Um, it's very decision-based. Um, it's very democratic. There's a lot of writing about Twine games as a force for democratizing the world of games. Right? You're not going to get different kinds of games until you get different kinds of people building it. And when I took this gaming workshop over the summer, we built a Twine game. Um, and it just struck me immediately. I was enthralled by the idea that, that somewhere in there, <laughs> there's a way to take historical documents and kind of Twineify them. And so that's the, the problem I threw out to my students last night, which was, OK, we've got this corpus of knowledge about Baltimore and lots of documents and newspaper articles and things like that. And we have Twine. Go. <laughs> Let's see what you can do with it. Um, for me, working on this class and, and working with my students this way has been an enormous learning experience, personally. Um, I've had to think really differently about pedagogy. Um, it's also much less structured. I'm the kind of person who likes a lot. I'm a person who likes a plan, I'm not going to lie. So, you know. <laughs> My syllabus is always complete on the first day. There's none of those you know, TBAs or flexibility really built into that. Um, and this class it doesn't really lend itself to that. It's much more um, 
collaborative, both for the students with each other, so in that they had to work in teams, which they find, frankly, a little bit uncomfortable. Historians don't, don't usually do that. Um, and also more collaborative with me and the students in ways that I'm not accustomed to having. So last night, we sat down and said, after we played around with Twine, and I said, all right, let's make up the parameters for this Twine assignment. You know, what seems workable? OK, how, you know, how are we going to handle citations? How are we going to handle, um, how fictional can you make this, what I'm calling interactive nonfiction, things like that, which I've, I've never done before. <laughs> um, it's also made me think a lot. This is a class of 12 people. It's very process driven. It's very hands on. And it's given me a lot of, of food for thought about how do I translate this to a larger class. A lot of my classes are 35 or 40 students. And so how do you, how do you make that work? How do you make that transition? The last piece I'll just say is that when the game design students finish Bandit, um, the last phase of it is that it'll be refined a little bit over the summer. Mark Alano is going to take charge of that. And then we're going to test the game in my Civil War class in the fall. So my Civil War students will play it. And we'll figure out, have you learned anything from this game? Or are you, you know, perplexed by why a fox is running through downtown Baltimore? So thank you all so much. And I look forward to hearing what you think. <coughs> Um, let's take questions for Anna and Josh. What would you like to know more about? Oh, am I the only one? Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, I, I don't know if this would be called a game. What I do in my classes is I've turned it into a talk show, and my students, um, like every week, they'll have four or five readings, and maybe there'll be four or five students, actually six students assigned to that week, because one of them is a host, and they have to do something kind of clever. And then the, what they do is they ask questions. And they, we treat it like a talk show. They sit in the front. I sit in the back. And, um, and they work with that for about 40 minutes. And then afterwards, we turn it over to the callers. And the callers can call in and, you know, with any questions that they have. So I don't know if that's considered a game. But um, it's like a simulation. Yeah, it's a simulation. But my question is, well, one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot, there's, there's uneven preparation on part of the part of the students. And I was wondering how you handle that. Um, because really, in turning the content over to the students so much that it's very obvious when one student hasn't prepared and one student has, and, and I struggle with exactly how to deal with that. So I was wondering if you had thought about that issue at all. I mean, I think about it in that I worry about it all the time, um, and that's a big piece of my worry. You know, my, my class of 12, they're so motivated and they're so excited that it hasn't been a problem. Everyone's been really on point and really prepared. I think the question is, what happens again when you translate that to a big group of people? I think I know that in, in reacting to the past, um, there's a lot of like the power of shame, which is they don't want to look stupid in front of their peers. Um, but I don't know how effective that that is in the end. I think maybe you just have to factor in that there's you know, going to be some percentage that's just not going to play along. So would it be a way to do a whole series of debates so they totally tank the first time they could kind of come back and get a second chance? Because I agree with the power of shame. They don't want to look bad in front of their peers, but is there a second chance for them to? Well, every student has to do it twice. So um, they have a first shot. And actually, I consider the first week those are my pioneers, and I, I meet with them beforehand to kind of go over the material and sort of set up what the, mm -hmm. the level should be for the class. But um, I, I just, you know, I think it's a struggle for all of us. I was just wondering if you had an institutionalized way of like, you know, sort of, um, but I think with a group of 12, there would be a different dynamic, because you know all of them the first day, and you mm -hmm. know what their styles are. And I'm, I, I have 60 across two yeah. classes, so, but, um, but yeah, so. Uh, it's complex. Uh, uh, what I did in a small group class was set up the rubric, and everybody understood what the grading rubric, what the criteria <coughs> was. And then anonymously, I had everybody do an evaluation and turn it into me. 
of the of the presenters themselves. Mm -hmm. That's including the yes. presenter. The presenter, if I uh, <coughs> knew, would sometimes reveal him or herself to me and said, "You know, I graded myself really low. I just want you to know that." <laughs> but it because it's anonymous, it seemed to to somewhat work. And did you did you distribute the evaluations to time, the students? Always. No, but I mean afterward, yes. Afterwards, so like they'll get Absolutely. thirty evaluations from their peers about. Well, their I might not have everybody grade all thirty all of the time. Maybe you do two sets. Because if you're evaluating, if you don't also participate and listen as well as if you're mm -hmm. not evaluating, or you listen differently. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had a question, and I was very intrigued by your saying that you thought that at this point that the folks making the game learned more than the people doing the games. And you're not the game you're making, but the games you do in class. And one of the criticisms in the past, in the old days, the old generations of using games teaching for teaching was this problem that it was, after all, just a game. You know, there was no stakes in it, and we, we know that What's key to how much a student learns is what they think about as they're doing an activity. Mm -hmm. And so I just wondered whether, in, as you think in some of these games, if there are triggers within the game to, for students to do, to be reflective, to, you mm -hmm. know, sort of metacognitive prompts, so that they're not just marching through the game trying to get from here to there, but the goal isn't just to get from here to there, it's to think about things as you go from here to there. <coughs> It seems like that might be key to how much students come away. Because you all, you designing the games are constantly doing that, right? You're going meta. You know, what does that mean? Right. How do we incorporate this? Right. What what kind of idea is that going to trigger? How do we capture the fact that, you know, you weren't really free when you mm -hmm. thought you were free? How do you capture that in the game? So you're doing all this metacognitive processing. But how do you get your players <laughs> to do that? Because I think that's right. key to the success of a game in terms of <laughs> cultivating learning. The game will be motivating. But whether it'll they'll actually come away and have learned something from it may depend on how reflective they are. Yeah, I think that's right. This this need for reflection afterwards, and maybe that's where you at, you know you have your students play a game for three quarters of the period, and then do a quick reflective writing, even if it's just jotting down their ideas. The other thing that we really, as a class, I think have came to agree upon in looking at a bunch of different history games is also that we we feel like they're good for teaching the small. Mm. <clears throat> Either the big meta ideas, because lots and lots of people, for example, have used games like Civilization, which is about imperialism and things like that. So either these big ideas about imperialism or small ideas like Oregon Trail, right? Like how do you experience the Oregon Trail and what are the pressures honing in on you, but, but sort of one or two days worth of activity. <coughs> Again, this is thinking more about video games or board games as opposed to these really fully immersive reacting to the past games where, where the students read literally hundreds of pages and are pulling together documents and writing a lot. That's a very different kind of activity. Um, I'd say I, this is, comes from both playing Reacting the Past, which I did recently um, at a, a, a workshop at um, Frostburg State University, um, and talking with Anne's class. The, um, the ability to reflect as a player of the game is really important for most games because, like Anne was saying, they're, they're very reductive. They're very, you take out a lot of detail. You have to get you know, you have to simplify the game so much yeah. that to, after playing, if you give students the um, opportunity or the requirement to reflect on how does how did the game sort of force you into uh, roles that aren't quite authentic, or given what you know about the history, forced you to do things that that uh, um, you kind of said, but this isn't quite the way it would be, or this isn't how I think it should be, that kind of thing. So, critiquing the game itself, I think, would be an important part of any any game. Um, as a player, um, and of course the designers are well immersed in that sort of, yeah, we got to take this out, but we have to do that because it'll make the game more compelling or more fun. Um, there was a game that was developed 
about 20 years ago when I thought, <coughs> excuse me, American Society for Engineering Education uh, called the Ethics Challenge. They worked with Lockheed Martin and came up with all these hypothetical scenarios. And it kind of got reduced down to a board game where they were just answering multiple choice questions saying how they would behave in certain ethical decisions. And so I kind of tore the game apart and forced them to be in teams. So they had to argue over what the hypothetical employee had to do, which kind of forced that reflection, right? They couldn't just right. blindly pick an answer and it was just theirs. Like their group had to agree that this employee was going to take that action. Uh, there's, so there's been a handful of papers published about that game in particular, but yeah, there are definitely, that kind of hits the middle part. Uh, I don't have them reflect during class, but they have a homework assignment due the next week where they have mm -hmm. to do a couple more of those hypothetical situations on their own. Just to, just to follow up on that, it seems to me, I, I have not done this in a classroom, that for the developers to like explain or justify in writing why they chose this this design choice mm -hmm. for their game or had the character do provide documents at this point in the game or whatever um, would lend itself to that. Right, and actually in my board game and, and also for these twine games, my board game they had to put together about a 12 to 15 page game design document that explains all the choices that they made that also includes um, citations and bibliography for, for all the information that they used and one of the the things we agreed on yesterday for their twine games is the same kind of process, not as long, obviously, because they're just one person. Mm -hmm. But again, a game explaining, okay, I created a composite character based on you know these three people, and here's why I did it. And exactly, so that, that you have to explain it. Um, and the other thing that they had to do for these board games was they had to write instructions. And so part of it was also making sure that and they all wanted to help the other teams play. And I said, no, 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 you can't help them. They need to figure it out. And it turned out one group played a game entirely wrong. And so all of those kinds of things. But yeah, I think the, the key piece for this to have a really powerful educational component, I think you have to have the reflection and the documentation and the self-consciousness about what you're doing. So, so you're saying that part of the assignment of the class, like for example, you talked about the, the rolling of the die to demonstrate the disproportionate ease mm -hmm. that uh, one individual over another would right. have. So they, they, behind that would be an academic assignment whereby they would have to demonstrate that they understood that from the historical material. Right, we put this mechanism in because we know that it was harder for secessionists to get out of prison, things like that. So Josh, did um, did you get any sense, and I know you, you didn't show us data, but did you get any sense that as you used your gamification approach that you did succeed in sort of moving <coughs> students out of a, it strikes me that that approach can help move students toward the idea that they are learning and achieving as they go as opposed to I'm just getting grades. Right. Do you get a sense of that, or have you tried to figure out a way to assess that, whether you're actually changing their mindset in the process? Yeah, I don't have any data, just anecdotes, which are <laughs> right? uh, but it, it's mixed. It, it's funny, I'll, I'll have students that I have for three semesters in a row, and they'll still have that begrudging attitude. They'll come to me and they're like, why did I lose points? I'll say, why did you not earn points? And they'll roll their eyes and say, how did I not earn points for, <laughs> you know, uh, for that kind of thing? But then there are others that really get into it, and so I guess I have, and on top of just those Likert scale questions, I did ask for like textual comments and feedback. And so there are definitely students that recognize what I was doing. Um, some of them are young parents and they have kids that are playing games. They really, they have been reading about that approach and motivating the way that their children learn and behave. And so they really, it was, blew my mind that they were putting all those things together and saying that they understood how it was nurturing a, a different type of learning environment. So I do have some quotes from students. Um, that some definitely recognize what's going on uh, and get better about it. I have a question for you too. Has the distribution of your grades changed since you implemented this gamification? I know that it's hard to measure learning, but right. are, are more students are more students doing better? Uh, so I'm, I've been doing it since I started. <laughs> so I don't, oh. I don't have the free <laughs> gamified versions of these courses, unfortunately. So that would be a good question. Yeah. Do students who grow up playing a lot of games do better? 
<laughs> so one thing that I try and do in my version of gamification is it's not invasive. And I try and communicate that early on that you can completely ignore this and it does nothing. And I actually provide two different versions of the syllabus. Like here's the straight laced percentages that it takes to get stuff done so you recognize this is a normal class. And here's this other document that shows, you know, a different way of looking at it and approaching it. And I don't tell them that they have to look at one. I mean, they're identical aside from these sorts of rebrandings. Uh, and so they get to pick and choose. So the majority choose um, to look at the gamified version, at least at first. Um, but I also have gotten some text comments back from students. They're like, this is obviously just the same as any other class. It didn't change my attitude one way or another. You know, arithmetic is arithmetic. <laughs> but you know, certain engineers are a little shrewd <laughs> like that, right? They, they can dissect the system and see exactly what it is. Um, but I do try and make it optional. Um, I definitely have had a couple of international students over the years um, who were interested about it but didn't understand it. Uh, and so again, they were very grateful that there was still this regular, uh, and I would never completely pull the rug out and not have a traditional syllabus. I wouldn't want to confuse anyone um, who did not want to get into it at all. But that's a really good concern. But unfortunately, then, then that feeds the problem of students saying, well, this is just another way to do it. You know, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, it's, so it's been interesting that they self-select so many of them, like, take the time to read, a, read the thing and see what's going on. Uh, this is the first semester that Blackboard has the achievement system the way that it does, so it's a little more invasive than previous semesters in that they can see they've earned an achievement regardless of what classes Blackboard site they're looking at. Um, so I'll be curious to see if some of the responses to some of the questions when I give surveys at the end of the semester have changed. Um, but they, Blackboard literally just, or at least our version, got implemented just this spring. Um, so I don't know how the new version of that will impact things. John, Sherry, have you all heard from other faculty trying to use the achievements? I know that Marianne has worked with a couple of folks who have shown interest in it. Yeah, I think we'll have data workshop maybe <laughs> come and talk about what you've done sure, sure. as well. Yeah. Um, two questions. One is, does anybody else teach these courses? Just you? Right now, it's just me. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, do you look at, like, it might be interesting just to see, like, if there is any anything that you could look at in Rex do you, uh, in terms of, like, what the hits were before oh, sure. your course prior yeah, no, the to hits the... hits have exploded uh, in these per two particular classes um, since I started taking over and started gamifying them. But, but also just with the uh, the new badging system and checking right. to see if people are... Yeah, to even compare this semester to previous semesters. Yeah. We'll have to look at that at the end of the term. But no, I definitely have been like top 10, top 20, I think, in terms of uh, the students accessing the Blackboard sites for this particular department. Well, I wanted to kind of finish up um, with a very, very brief discussion of some of the, the principles of learning uh, in, in gaming uh, that come from this book. The, 36 learning principles James V has uh, in this book. Um, and I've chosen just four to focus on because uh, there's no way we have time to go over all 36. But um, one of the principles of effective game design um, is the subset principle. The idea that learning um, should take place in a simplified, simplified subset of the target domain, whatever the content is that you want to teach. Um, you have to simplify it somewhat for learners to make their way into it. Um, and we talked about that already um, uh, with regard to the, the history games that Anne's students are working on. But having them focus on just certain aspects um, is, is, is a way to help them to get into the game to begin with. Um, then there's the active critical learning principle, the idea that the learning environment has to encourage active, critical, not passive learning. Um, learners need to think act and experience consequences. Consequences are really important. That's, a, that's an important part of the game situation. Even though it's a simulation, they, they have the feeling of this is, this is uh, there are results to what I'm doing here. There are, are consequences for what I'm doing. Um, and pursuing goals um, in an environment that is variable. It's not in a static environment. Um, good games also uh, in, in embody the probing principle. That is that learning is a cycle of probing the world, doing something reflecting on the action, and then forming a hypothesis, reprobing, testing, all that sort of thing. Um, an, ex an effective game has to present a functional environment in which, game, uh, in which players choose from and evaluate many different actions. The goal is to find the right course of action via experimentation, making choices, 
experiencing consequences, but in a safe, supported environment where they're not going to get hurt or the consequences are not ones that are going to, you know, um, seriously damage the futures. Um, and then last but not least, the practice principle. Learners get lots of practice in a, in a good game, um, in a context where practice is not boring. Um, it could be a virtual world um, that, uh, that they, um, as they go through, they, they gradually experience greater success. Um, to encourage practice, and that's good, game, good, good habits, a good game gradually increases the difficulty level of the in-game challenges. The player, it keeps players engaged and encourages them to continually work at and, and hone their skills. Um, and I think that's it. I, I, there are so many resources available. These are just a few of the ones that I was able to draw on um, for this. And um, if you're interested in having a copy of the, the slides that I put together, feel free to contact me. Just shoot me an email, um, kcapart at, at uh, you know, uc.edu. Um, and I would point out um, that this, this is the source that had the stats that I, that I was drawing on. They, they have a lot of information about the, the uh, games programs that are out there. Um, and I should have mentioned that the, the, uh, um, the work that the um, info te information technology here at UMBC is doing on, on gaming. Um, but uh, there's also research being done by the Games Learning Society Center, among many other places, among, among many other um, academic centers, um, into the uh, impact <coughs> of games on learning. So that's a good source for you all. And this is a relatively new, um, I don't know exactly when the uh, Office of Educational Technology started its games and learning program, but it's relatively recent, within the past, I'd say, five years or so. Um, anyway, final thoughts, questions? Comments? I just have one quick question. Do you see that the future of gaming is toward technology? Like, it, it seems like a lot of what's being discussed here has to do with interfaces with computers. And like, when I think of games, I think of things that we do in the classroom together in the absence mm -hmm. of a computer, that we're actually interacting with each other in a non traditional way. I think the, the or is it multifaceted? It could be a whole bunch of different multifaceted. things. Multifaceted. I think there's a lot of freedom to do what you want with. I'd say the money is is with technology <laughs> because I mean things like reacting to the past, that uh, highly elaborate role playing game. There's just not money to be made in that. There's a little bit of money, but not much really. Um, so. I would say that there's money in the technology, but what I've been really struck by is um, how much you can do for no money. I mean, I love, frankly, I love your um, talk show panel idea, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't cost anything. You know? exactly. So that, that I think if you, or, or these board games that my student, you know, I'm yeah. really impressed with how, how well that worked because I had no idea how <coughs> it was going to work. I, I have one other game that I'll quickly share if that's okay. Sure. Um, I, I teach a course called Comparative Political Institutions, and the first uh, the first couple of weeks we talk about governing the commons. When you have a mm -hmm. commonly pulled resource, and if everybody extracts from the commons, it'll be depleted, and so we play a game about how to prevent that from happening. I mean, that's the spirit of the game, that we prevent it from mm -hmm. happening. And the idea is that I am nature, um, and the rest of the students are just inhabitants of this nature. and. They all, they all are given an equal amount of resource to begin with, and we all have these options, and there's a very strict set of rules that they have to follow. And ultimately, I'll just share that the, the, the spirit of the game, the only way for the students to win is to pool all their resources together against me. Mm -hmm. But it is fascinating how it sometimes takes three hours for the students to figure that out because they're forming these like regional blocks and like two students, like we can go against them, but then there's a group of three against a group of four. And finally, somebody figures out, if we just all agree to cooperate and make this an iterative process, we can beat her, because I'm sitting there with all the candy, because I, <laughs> I have, you know, and they're just like, even if right now, if we just did it over and over and over again, eventually we would have all the candy and we just agree to distribute it amongst ourselves. <coughs> so it's, it's like, that's the kind of game that excites me because it's like, you know, the students, um, and that was the direct message of a, ne a book that we read by Eleanor Ostrom, and, and it, was, it was really great. So I think game-based um, learning falls under the Venn diagram of things under active learning, right? Yeah, it's right. students to think and to do and to, so any of those types of simulations or games or any of that is going to get students to be more engaged, I would think, and so yeah, I mean, 
definitely there are facets of game-based learning that I think are both technological. I think the drive for technology is the hope that we can get all these autonomous learners to finally, who yeah. haven't had the ability to have access to these things, to have them. Um, but there's still total value. And, and I would say even, I don't know, we should find some data on board <coughs> games, but like the Euro-style gaming industry is exploding, like non-traditional board mm -hmm. games. Um, so I think there's room for it all, for sure. Excellent. That's good to know. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Josh and Ann, for sharing your experiences. Thank you. Thank you.